So I want to talk to you about a guy named Dennis Witzke. So Dennis Witzke is an alias that this individual uses in the New Milford, Connecticut area. He is also a famous actor and he goes by the name of Ed Harris. I do not know this for a fact, but he may also go by the name of Zeke Cable. And the Cable family is kind of a notorious name in the town of New Milford, Connecticut. They are known for being a, a family that gets into trouble with the cops. They get drunk and get into fights. They're known as townies. But everybody is afraid of them. And there are rumors about that family being involved with incest. So what everybody should begin to realize is that the military is a criminal organization that likes to promote sadistic killers that have no conscience. That is what does best in the military because their business is to kill people. There is this political campaign where people think the military is like joining the Boy Scouts. You join the military in a time of peace, you serve your country, you get trained. You get taught how to be a man or be a woman and then you are released into society as a better human being because of that. This is a huge lie. The US military is like a prison and they have killed millions of young men and women who wanted to join the military because they heard of some benefit of joining the military. They thought it had some honor in it and these people wind up dead. If there's no enemy to kill in the military, these sadistic higher ups in the military run drills and operations where they kill their own people because they only want the most sadistic, subhuman, and evil people in the military. And one of those individuals is Dennis Whitsky, also known as Ed Harris. And he's also known as Otis Tool. So Otis Tool is one of the worst serial killers that you will ever hear about. I will urge anybody to look up Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Tool, who were two homosexual men who supposedly killed more than a thousand people starting around 1976 until they were arrested in 1983. So I'm going to explain how these secret societies use men like Dennis Witzke to do a lot of these killings. This is like entertainment for them. This is the meaning of their life. This is what they are all into in these secret societies. When you see these specials on TV, what are the Freemasons hiding? What are these secrets that they're hiding? They'll show you that it's a flag folding ceremony and they carry the United States flag around a room and then hand it to one of their people. They explain that they have uh, banquets where they dress up and they eat pasta. No, the secrets in the Freemasons is that they practice occult ritual murder. The whole group takes part in these games that set up regular American people to get abducted or placed in a position where these serial killers have access to them and these people wind up getting abducted, tortured, and killed. And all these little freaks and the secret societies like to show up for the show when these oddest tools have their victims tied up in some barn somewhere. All these little freaks that live in the area will all pay money to come show up and watch oddest tool torture and kill somebody. That's the big secret in their secret societies. That's what the Freemason documentaries on TV or on Netflix will never tell you. That is what all the secrecy is about. Not their secret handshake. Not their secret flag folding ceremony. Not their lasagna dinners. But that they practice organized crime, human trafficking, and occult ritual murder.
So when you look up Otis Tool and Henry Lee Lucas, you will see that they admitted to killing a thousand people. And then later they said, no, it wasn't that much. In fact, we didn't kill anybody at all. So these guys are compulsive liars. What is interesting to note is that they said that they worked with a group called the Hand of Death, which was a paramilitary organization based out of Florida. They said they had a secret military base down in the Everglades area of Florida, I believe. And that they had a list of targets all around the country that the Hand of Death organization was supposed to go after, kidnap, and then kill. They were also into abducting children. And there is a report of Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole bringing some of these kids down to a ranch in Mexico where they had human sacrifice rituals. So since I knew Ed Harris, also known as Otis Toole, as Dennis Witzke, I'm going to explain to you how they get close to their targets. I am going to explain the whole practice of these secret societies abducting people or getting them into a position where they could be attacked by these secret society members. So the first thing everybody should understand is that it is not a weird hand of death cult, some paramilitary cult. This is your military. This is your U.S. military. This is your U.S. military working in sync with the Freemasons, the Odd Fellows. And I think their highest ranking members are called Templar Knights. They are part of an organization called the Brotherhood or the Knights Templar. They refer to the Knights Templar as the Brotherhood. So what they do is that they take over an area. That makes it very easy for them to do these killings. And one of these areas is New Milford, Connecticut. That whole area is like one big military base. New Milford, Connecticut is something of a rural town. It's kind of known as being a redneck town. But there are a lot of shops in New Milford. When you drive down Route 7, there are a lot of shopping plazas. It looks like a lot of businesses are in that area. They also have a downtown area that looks kind of nice. There's a place called Railroad Street and they have the old train station there. And then along that road they have several cafes and bars. And then there is a couple of side streets with little shops, bookshops, tobacco shops, a toy store. So it looks like a little quaint area. So I worked as an EMT at a company called Danbury Ambulance in Danbury, Connecticut. I worked as an emergency medical technician and there was a retired state trooper that worked there too. He had retired from being a cop and he took a job driving a wheelchair car, driving a wheelchair van with a hydraulic lift and his name was Al. I forget his last name and Al told me that he had heard that New Milford, Connecticut was historically a penal colony. Back in colonial America, back in the 1700s and 1800s, they would send all of their undesirables into the New Milford area. All of these criminals and people that had issues that the other colonies did not want around them, for some reason they would send them into the, the Milford area. So that is a pretty interesting description of New Milford, Connecticut. So I lived right next door to New Milford, Connecticut in a town called Brookfield. And one year I had to go to summer school in New Milford because Brookfield High School did not have summer school that year due to tax cuts or something. And it seems like it was a bigger school in New Milford. There are more people in the Milford. And there is a big population in the Milford of people that are retarded or have birth defects. And I think that there is a great deal of people that live in poverty or near poverty in the Milford. Another interesting fact about New Milford is that it is jokingly referred to as New Mildew. 
And that is a reference most likely to how much mold, how much black mold is all over the town of Nemilford. In a lot of these old houses, there is going to be found mold. And the military is very familiar with mold and the effects of mold and that it drives people crazy. And that is exactly what the military is looking for with their people. They have programs where they take black mold and they purposely install it into houses that are for sale. And they get that stuff to grow all over the entire community. I think even on their Oddfellows Lodge, you could see black mold. So when they have a bunch of people that are breathing black mold that they're putting all over the houses, these people are prone to psychosis. And that is exactly what the U.S. military is looking for when they place these people under mind control during their occult practices. This is how they scare people into handing their firstborn children over to the military, over to the Knights Templar, over to the high-ranking members of the Odd Fellows organization so that they could kill their firstborn children in these occult rituals that they all live to do. And by handing their firstborn children over to these degenerates, supposedly these families are then left alone. They're no longer tortured or persecuted by these military organizations. They're given jobs. They're not attacked as long as they sit in their houses and breathe their black mold and do whatever the local chapter of the Freemasons tell them to do. So that is how these military controlled regions operate. So in the New Milford area is where Dennis Witzke, also known as Ed Harris, lived right around the year of 2000. So my mother was living in Brookfield with her husband who was an elderly man. He was something like 20 or 25 years older than she was. And after staying married to him for 10 or 12 years, he became elderly. And they were not getting along too well. And so Dennis Witzke, also known as Ed Harris, was hired to do some work at my mother and stepfather's house concerning putting a retaining wall in the backyard. There was a drainage problem from the road and the yard was rinsing away. So he came with these like chicken wire cages and something called rip wrap rock. So he formed these wire cages and then used an excavator to fill those cages with the rip wrap. And those cages were partially buried along the border of our backyard. So that helped the yard from rinsing away due to the drainage problem that we had. So Dennis began to hit on my mother he would wait for her at the bottom of the road in his uh, pickup truck and kind of wave at her. And then he would hold up coffee and donuts to her and said, I, I brought coffee and donuts for you. So they began to date. And like I said, my stepfather was around uh, 70 at that time. So I do not think that they were getting along so well. And he acted like he really didn't care that she was seeing Dennis Witzke. I don't even think that he was staying at the house. By that time I had moved out with my girlfriend named Kim and we had an apartment in the Milford. And the reason we moved there was because the rent was cheap. We got a two bedroom apartment for 700 a month and it was a lot nicer than the apartments that they had in Danbury and Bethel. So I want to tell you how men like Dennis Witzke, also known as Ed Harris, also known as Otis Tool, will try to destabilize your life. So our lease was about to run up in the Milford. And Dennis told my mom, why don't they stay, why doesn't Kim and John stay at my house in Sherman, Connecticut, which was right next to the Milford. For the most part, I'm hardly there. And they could use one of the rooms upstairs to stay in and... They don't have to pay me any rent. So we thought he was a great guy. So at that time we were looking to buy a condo. And we eventually found one in Brookfield, Connecticut. So for about two or three months, we stayed at Dennis Whiskey's house in Sherman, Connecticut. So when we finally got our mortgage for our condo in Brookfield, 
I guess we moved into that condo in Brookfield around the summer of 1999. So in the spring of 2000, Dennis Witzke made the suggestion to my mother that I come work for him. At that time, I was working at Danbury Ambulance for about $12.50 an hour. And I'd been there for about three years. And while working there as a wheelchair car driver, it was a van with a hydraulic lift. I went to school to get my EMT or emergency medical technician degree, my certificate, and then I started working as an EMT on an ambulance. So I remember around 2000, the union came in. The employees there brought the union in. They voted the union in and our pay increased and I was making pretty good money there. I was making more money than I had at any other job I ever worked at. I had just gotten a raise when the union came in and I had overtime, which paid time and a half. But my mom said that Dennis will pay you $15 an hour and you can learn a trade from Dennis. You'll learn a little bit about construction and tree removal through Dennis. So why don't you quit your job at Danbury Ambulance and come work for Dennis? So I finally agreed to that in April of 2000. And that was a bad decision. And I want to urge everybody, if you ever get a job and you have a good position that pays okay, you have a union job, you just got a raise, you've been there for three years, I would highly recommend you try to keep that job. Because the military is very fond of destabilizing your life. And they'll do that quite often through employment. They'll offer you a better position somewhere else or something that sounds like a better position, but it isn't. And when you start working there, you'll find that your old job was better. But by then it will be too late because you already quit your old job. So now you're at the mercy of this new job, which is often a setup. So try to use your mind when you're going through this, when you're going through life. And don't let these people manipulate you. So a red flag should have gone up. I've been in a job for three years. My mom meets a new boyfriend. Why on earth would he say, have your son quit his job, quit his good job that he's been at for three years, and then come work for him for something like a hundred more dollars a week. It isn't too much. Going from $12.50 to $15 an hour. And what I also didn't pay attention to was that my commute would go from a 10 minute commute from Brookfield to Danbury to a half hour or 40 minute long commute to the Milford to Sherman because his business was based out of his house. So when I started working for Dennis, he set me up a few times to try to embarrass me or set me up for failure. And one of those times included that he brought me to one of his customers houses and he gave me a little push lawnmower and he said you have to mow the backyard with this little push lawnmower because there were a lot of rocks in that backyard but the grass was like a foot tall so he said just be careful not to hit a rock and on that particular day my mother was with us Dennis had arranged for her to come meet us at the uh, customer's house and then they were supposed to go on an estimate or go out and do something. So she was to come pick him up and take him somewhere. So he gives me this lawnmower and tells me to cut the back of this guy's property, which kind of looked like a rocky cliff. And the grass is like a foot tall. So after mowing for like a half hour or 40 minutes and getting about three quarters of the way done, I hit a rock and it bent the blade on the lawnmower. So it completely ruined the lawnmower. But there was no way to avoid that because you just couldn't see any of the rocks. So for some reason, this idiot decided to let the grass grow up a foot tall. And then he sent somebody who's not familiar at all with that property or mowing that property and said, go ahead and cut the lawn and do that in front of your mom, who I arranged to come meet us here because we have to go on an estimate or we have to go out and do an errand. Because I want her to see you fail. So 
So it kind of embarrassed me. And Dennis was like, yeah, I told you to take your time and, and uh, avoid the rocks. I'm like, well, it's kind of hard to do with the grass being so high, but I'm sorry. And my mom felt bad. And she went out and she bought him a new lawnmower. And knowing my mom, she's probably spent five, six hundred dollars on the top of the line lawnmower to replace his little piece of crap lawnmower that I just broke. So I think that he was uh, impressed. Or impressed is the bad word to use. Maybe intimidated when we cut down a few trees. And we cut the tree up into sections using chainsaws. And then we had to pick up these giant logs and throw it on the back of his pickup truck that was pretty high up. It was a big truck with a really strong axle to carry heavy loads of cut up trees. And you basically had to pick the log up almost over your head to throw it on the back of this truck. And so I am working with Dennis's usual employees who are Brazilian guys. For some reason he had a thing about only hiring Brazilian people who lived in Danbury. And these Brazilian men did not speak English. They spoke very little English. But they were around 50 years old. And they looked pretty strong. They had some muscle on them. And so I did not have a problem picking up any of the logs that he cut. Just the same as these 50 year old men. So I think that that may have been another setup in where I would get tired or would be unable to pick up some of these tree logs. But I was always a pretty strong kid who enjoyed to work. So his first setup didn't really work. And I remember after that day, he was looking at me like he was a little nervous or a little bit uh, weirded out. So he began to try to argue with me every day. He began to try to argue with me and complain about everything that I was doing. And I did not argue with him. I just accepted the criticism. I just tried to be agreeable. And another one of their games was that his good buddy, his employee named Antonio, quit. And so I had been getting along fine with his two employees. One was Antonio and the other guy was named Edson. And... We got along fine. There wasn't ever an issue. So it was kind of a surprise to hear that Antonio quit. And Dennis walked around the entire week like he was heartbroken. Like his world just collapsed. And eventually I said, why did Antonio quit? And he said, because he does not like working with Americans. And I said, excuse me? And he said, Antonio doesn't like working with Americans. And I said, well, that's kind of funny because he is in America and all. So that seems like a weird thing to say to his boss. I'm a newcomer from Brazil and I moved to America, but I don't like working with Americans. So I'm only going to get along well with my boss if my American boss only hires Brazilians. So that suggested that both Antonio as well as Dennis were both crazy. And if that was the case, if I was going to ruin Antonio's life and then ruin Dennis's life by quitting my job to go work for him, Dennis should never have suggested that to my mother. So this was all a setup to try to mess with my mind, to try to make me think that I was ruining things. I was just creating one big mess after the next for Dennis Witzke. First I break his old piece of shit lawnmower. So my mom has to buy him a brand new lawnmower. And next, me being American is causing his beloved Brazilian employees to quit. And so for Dennis to go along with that and pay that any mind shows that Dennis is also anti-American for him to put up with that. And he basically explained that Antonio was a hard worker and Antonio had a farm in Brazil and he still owned that farm in Brazil. And he went on to say that Antonio rented a house in uh, Danbury, Connecticut. And he put up sheetrock. So he transformed like the living room and uh, the bedrooms into these weird little cubicles. And then he would rent these little cubicles out to uh, new coming Brazilians. And he would make a lot of money. So this shows you what type of guy this Antonio was. 
He looked kind of like a European Brazilian. He was not a dark-skinned man. Both him and Edson looked like Europeans. They had blue eyes and fair skin. And so this is how they would handle the new Brazilians coming to the area. I think Dennis said the ones that didn't have a green card or didn't have all their paperwork in order could be trafficked through Antonio's house. So Antonio was just really smart according to Dennis. This was a type of guy that would get into the heart of Dennis Witzke. This was a type of guy that Dennis Whiskey would really admire and respect. I don't know if that's an exactly legal practice to do that, to rent a house and put up sheetrock to convert all the bedrooms and the living room into little tiny cubicles where you could then rent those cubicles out to Brazilians that don't have their green cards or don't have all their paperwork in order. This sounds like something of a corrupt man. And then he wants to quit his job in America because he does not want to work alongside an American. So this is another setup. So we were installing a patio on our last job. And Dennis Witzke must have put something in my thermos. I would bring in water or iced tea in a thermos. And he must have drugged me. Because I remember uh, having no energy the last two days on the work site. I could barely push the wheelbarrow around. It was like my body weighed a thousand pounds. And I felt like I was going to pass out. And Dennis kept on yelling at me that I wasn't moving fast enough. And he had something like a surveyor scope. So the whole time he's sitting there looking through a surveyor scope. And he's doing this for like an hour or two hours. So I've put in many patios since then. And I have no idea why somebody would have to look through a surveyor scope for two hours straight to put in this little patio in someone's backyard. It was uh, a little ways out into their yard. So I think that he really didn't have anything to do. And I think that he really didn't like to work. And so his excuse was to stand there and look through this surveyor scope while his remaining employee, Edson, would assist him in this very delicate process of picking out exactly where this patio had to be placed in the yard. And so they would scowl at me as I was digging dirt, putting it into a wheelbarrow, and then going to dump it. I think they wanted me to dump the wheelbarrow on the back of the truck after pushing it up a ramp. And they're scowling at me saying, you're not working fast enough. What physical work is too tough for you, huh? Some people are not cut out for landscaping. John just might be a big wimp. And they're just glaring at me the whole time. As they're sitting there jerking off with a surveyor scope. So I think I had met them at that job site with my car. So after two or three hours of the second day, I just knew something was wrong. And so I just got into the car and I left. And I quit. So now I did not have my good job at Danbury Ambulance anymore. So Dennis had ruined my career. That was a good job for me, working as an emergency medical technician. They also had limos to drive on the weekends. Sometimes they'll give me a shift driving a limo for somebody's wedding. So I lost a very good opportunity by quitting that job that I'd been at for three years to go work for that psycho in New Milford. So I think that I should conclude with this. After I left the job site and I went home, I was sick for something like two weeks. Whatever Dennis Witzke had given me had made me sick for about two weeks. It was a terrible illness and it was like going through vertigo. I've never been sick in that fashion before. I was always dizzy. I had terrible headaches and I was throwing up. So whatever he had given me, had placed me in that state for two weeks. It started off as a terrible weakness, and then it went to this vertigo state. So when I finally went to the hospital, they told me I had Lyme's disease, and they gave me some medication that helped the Lyme's disease, and I eventually got better. But knowing what I know about these people is that Dennis drugged me. This was a setup. So when you analyze what Otis Tool was doing, 
him and his buddy Henry Lee Lucas was that they were saying that they were handy men and they would begin dating women, single women, who often had children. So I would bet that they would get into the house the same way as Dennis Witzke approached my mother, first by doing work for them. That is how the Freemasons introduce their serial killers into people's lives. They know where a single woman is. They know where a woman lives who has an elderly husband who she's not getting along good with, who she is in the process of breaking up with. And they send in one of their agents, one of their Templar knights, one of their brothers to act as a hero. Here comes Big Dennis Witzke with his excavator. And he's going to rip up the yard and install this retaining wall. And then he's going to hang out with his pickup truck at the bottom of the lady's road. And as she drives up, he's going to wave at her like uh, she's the best thing he's ever seen. And then hold up coffee and donuts for her. Because he's just an old lonely guy from the nearby town of Sherman. And she is just the cutest woman he has ever seen. And he just wants to hit on her or hang out with her or be her friend. When in fact, my mother is the type of person that the Freemasons, the Knights Templar, and the U.S. military have put on one of their lists as a target. She has become one of their targeted individuals. She has been put on one of their lists of somebody they are allowed to go after to attempt to abduct and kill. So Dennis Witzke wanted to impress my mother. So they put on some more games to impress her. And she told me the story that there was uh, some woods behind his house in Sherman. And so when she first met him, he said, I want to bring you out to go hunting with me. So he took his rifle and they walked out a little ways into the woods. He said they didn't walk hardly far at all. And Dennis started pointing into the distance and says, you see that? That's a deer. And she couldn't see the deer, but Dennis could. So Dennis points his rifle and he fires a round. Then he says, there's another one. And he fires a second shot. And my mother says, when they walked out, he not only shot one deer, he shot two deer. So Dennis Witzke, also known as Ed Harris, is not only a hero, he's not only a tough construction guy who can hang in there for many years while her son can't hang in there for hardly a month or two. He is also a master hunter. He could go out into the woods behind his house and within a period of minutes, he'll shoot not only one deer, but two deer. So my mother would believe something like that. But the truth is that him and his buddies brought two dead deer out into the woods and dropped them there. And then he walked out there with my mom, fired two shots at nothing, and then walked her out there to where him and his buddies had dropped the two deer and said, look what I just shot. It was another setup. So my mother would have respect for him. And she would uh, romance the idea of Dennis Witzke, also known as Ed Harris, quite often. She would say, I know that you don't get along with Dennis, but I love that he's an outdoors type man. I love that he's an outdoors man. He's into hunting and fishing, and he's like an American Indian. How well he knows the woods and knows about nature. He is nothing but a con man. He is nothing but a snake and a serial killer. And this is all an act that they put on to win real people over. So this is what Otis Tool and Henry Lee Lucas were doing in the late 70s and early 80s. Is that they would go meet a uh, single woman who would hire them as a handyman. She would have to have some work done on her property without her husband or boyfriend being around. And who would come for the job but Otis Tool or Henry Lee Lucas. And they act very nice. They put on the charm. They will act like construction workers. Well experienced construction workers. If you go out hunting with them, they'll shoot two deer dead. So these are the type of things that are arranged 
in their military controlled regions. This is how all of their brothers, their odd fellow brothers, their Knights Templar brothers, all work together to set up these situations. I wouldn't be surprised if these single women that were attacked by Otis Tool and Henry Lee Lucas were made single due to the fact of these people living in a military controlled region. So what they'll do is that they will attack these men by destabilizing their life. They'll get them fired from their jobs. They'll get them to quit their good jobs and go work for these uh, companies controlled by these odd fellows or these Knights Templar members or these Freemasons and they'll set them up to fail. They will drug them. They'll try to set them up so that they'll fail at work. They'll try to set them up to get into fights with the people they work with. And if they don't fall for any of their games and they prove to be sensible people and good employees, they will just start drugging them. They will make them sick so that they're unable to work. So some of uh, these women's husbands may die. They may continue to show up at whatever company these Freemasons own. And sooner or later, they come down with an illness that they die from. Oftentimes, these people may get depressed and decide to go to a bar. And the Freemasons will arrange for them to get into an argument with one of their brothers. And then they'll get arrested. Or they'll do things to cause stresses in the house. So that the people get into arguments and they end up breaking up. To get the real dad or the real man out of the house and move in Dennis Witzke. Also known as Otis Tool and his buddy Henry Lee Lucas. So I think that that is what they were doing. They were moving in with single women who had children. And they were using that proximity to attack them. So once again, I think I am alive and here today because of acts of God. It's kind of funny that they say acts of God is something like a hurricane or something that destroys something in an insurance claim. They use that phrase a lot in insurance paperwork. But an act of God may also mean a good thing. So I believe in God. I believe in God's angels. And believe me, when you look into the actions of Otis Toole and Henry Lee Lucas, if you don't believe in God, you may start to believe in Satan. You may start to believe in absolute evil on earth. You may start to believe in demons. Because that is what these people are. In fact, on the Wikipedia page, Otis Tool says that his uh, grandmother was a Satanist who would introduce him to Satanic rituals. And he was allowed to get raped by friends of his mother when he was a young boy. And once he was uh, 10 years old, he realized that he was a homosexual. And then from the years 1966 to 1973, he was a drifter. So the truth is that Otis Toole grew up in a military household. His family were probably Freemasons. And if you look up the career of the actor Ed Harris, was that in the uh, 70s, Ed Harris started his acting career by landing a lot of roles on television. So that is what the Freemasons and the military and the U.S. government, that is what this criminal establishment will arrange for their Freemasonic brothers, for their Templar brothers, a comfy job acting on a TV show. So it says on Wikipedia that Ed Harris acted on one episode of this TV show and then acted on another episode of another TV show. So it was quick money. Just show up and play this role on TV. It takes you a day. It takes you a couple of days. And everybody knows actors are pretty well paid. So act for a couple of days. Here's some money. Then go back to whatever town that you're assigned to and do what we want you to do over there, which is go after the next target on their U.S. military Templar Brotherhood hit list, who Otis Tool referred to as the Hand of Death, a paramilitary group out of Florida with a base in Florida 
that was into human trafficking and abducting children. This is how they do it. They don't necessarily run up to kids on the street, grab them and throw them in the back of a van. They'll knock on your door with a big smile on their face, there to do some work for you. Then they'll show up with their excavators and their pickup trucks and do all this great work on your property. Then ask your mom out on a date and then eventually move into your house where they will poison your mom. And then your mom will get sick and go to the hospital and your mom will die in the hospital. And it's a good thing that old Uncle Otis Toole and his good buddy Henry Lee Lucas are there to watch after you and your brothers and your sisters because your dad got arrested or your dad moved away. And then when your mom got sick, the only people that are there to care for you is Uncle Otis Toole and his gay boyfriend that he calls his good buddy Henry Lee Lucas. So these men are homosexual. You may call them bisexual. But the truth is that they hate women. They have no compassion. And they get a kick out of hurting people and setting people up to get hurt. And they make a lot of money doing that. So if your name comes up on a list, you're just one of the thousand people on their list that Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Tool will set up to die or rape, torture, and kill you. They go through thousands of you. They don't care how sweet your mom is. They don't care what a nice person your mom is. This is what they do for the Knights Templar. This is what they do for the Freemasons. This is what they do for the Odd Fellows. This is what they do for their U.S. military. This is what they call serving their country. This is what has taken over your U.S. government. So, Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole were arrested around 1983. There are a few interviews on YouTube of Otis Toole talking about some of these murders. And then supposedly he dies in the 90s when he was something like, what, 50 or 60 years old. So that's just more establishment bullshit. So Otis Toole is arrested in 1983 and then he's released as Ed Harris famous Hollywood movie star who gets all these big roles in movies now. No more little TV episodes for Eddie Harris. He's now a famous Hollywood movie star. And Ed Harris goes on to get a bunch of big roles in Hollywood next. That was his big reward for committing thousands of murders with Henry Lee Lucas. Taking out all of these uh, military targets on their hit list also known as single women and their children, American citizens in America. That is the big bad targets of the U.S. military. That is why I am the first to call these men heroes and give them the respect that they deserve. Because one day the American people are going to wake up and realize that these men are worse than tyrants. To call these men tyrants is too good for them. So Otis Tool is arrested in 1983 and then he's released as Ed Harris. So what is also interesting to note is that Ed Harris is a commodity. It's a product. They have two or three men that act under the name of Ed Harris. So if you say, well, Ed Harris was doing movies around this time that you say he was hanging out with your mom, I will say that these actors have doubles. They call them their twins. And Ed Harris's twin brother is an actor called Scott Wilson. Look up the actor Scott Wilson and compare him to the actor Ed Harris. These two men are interchangeable. Dennis Witzke and Scott Wilson could both act as Ed Harris. And they probably have a dozen people that could do that too. They do that again and again and again through Hollywood. They do that with the actor known as Leonardo DiCaprio. The original Leonardo DiCaprio kind of got old and fat. So they had to replace him. Also, Russell Crowe, 
When you go to see uh, movies with Russell Crowe in them, it's not always the original Russell Crowe. It's whatever actor they could send to the makeup studio to resemble Russell Crowe. That's what they do in military Hollywood. Is that they have a bunch of doubles. They have a bunch of lookalikes. They have a bunch of clones who all resemble the same man or the same woman. And they all act as the product known as Ed Harris or the product known as Leonardo DiCaprio or the product known as Russell Crowe. There is no individuality in the Freemasons. There is no individuality in the U.S. military. They want all their guys to think alike. They want all their guys to look alike. Nobody stands out as being an individual in the military. Nobody stands out as being an individual in the Freemasons. And they especially do not like families because that too promotes individuality and self-esteem when you have a wife and you have children. So that is your wife and those are your children and you're there to respect your wife and your children, to protect your wife and your children, to support your wife and your children. That is the base of individuality. Here, Kayla, here's another one. Yeah. Oh, no, not, not in the eyes. See, that's why Halloween masks yeah, are good. And these guys hate that. They are into group sex. They don't want anybody to have one particular husband or wife. They're all into group sex. If you date one of their women, if you're a regular guy and you date one of their women, this woman will go out and have sex with whoever the military tells her to as something of a program to remind her that she is not special. Sex is not special. And as long as you're dating John Harwood, you have to go have sex with all these nasty old men just to remind you what you need to do when you get home, which is poison John Harwood and take out John Harwood. So they have all sorts of programs within their groups and their communities. They have sex with everybody. They are used as child prostitutes. They are taught to look at sex as something that is borderline disgusting. And the more disgusting it is, the more it turns on some of these people. So some of these uh, acts, these uh, acts that combine sex and violence become more and more disgusting because that is what the military is trying to do. Create a race of people that equate sex and violence. They hate any individuality. They hate the family unit and they have lists of targets that they go after. And that includes single women living with two or three children in a house somewhere that these sadistic agents of the U.S. military and these secret societies like the Odd Fellows and the Freemasons and the Knights Templar could go after to torture and kill. So I thank God that I am here today to explain some of this. I always knew something was wrong. Something always felt wrong about the world to me since I was a teenager. And when I got a little older and began looking into conspiracy theories on the internet, it began to make sense to me why I always thought something was wrong with the world. Because we have a very evil force that has taken over our planet, that has taken over our government. So when you hear about the Illuminati, when you hear about the conspiracy, and they always tell you it's well-known actors, well-known politicians, well-known corporate executives, well-known reporters and people in the media who are involved in the Illuminati, who are involved in the secret societies, who are involved in the conspiracy, 
who are involved in these satanic or occult practices. They are not lying because they want you to look at their most evil men and women as heroes, as stars, as your leaders. And then they get on TV and they go through their little act and everybody believes it. Everybody believes that Trump says a few good things, that Trump is uh, okay. Nothing is further from the truth. These people are the worst tyrants that they have in the military and these secret societies. These are the worst people in the world. That is why they're trusted to be politicians on TV. Why they are trusted to be Hollywood stars. Because they have sold their soul to the devil. They belong heart and soul to complete evil. They take part in one evil act, one treacherous act after the next, and they enjoy it. And their reward is to act as your president. Is to act as your governor. Is to act as the mayor of your town. Is to act as the head of the police is to act as the head of the FBI, is to act as a reporter on 60 Minutes or NBC News, is to act as some famous Hollywood star that is just really beautiful or is really cute. And what a talented, awesome actor they are. These are the world's villains. These are the world's tyrants. And it's nothing but one big scam from these secret societies and these military controlled governments like the United States and England. So what is very important to understand about men like Dennis Witzke, also known as Ed Harris, is that once these individuals have some sort of contact with you, these type of men will develop some sort of fatal attraction mentality with you. These are very sick individuals and the military will take advantage of the fact that they are very sick individuals with psychotic problems because that is the type of person that will function best as a stalker as somebody who will follow you to whatever state you happen to move to and do whatever it takes to get back into your life so they could get another chance to ruin your life that is the mentality of these stalkers that is the mentality of these MK Ultra agents Due to their abuse and their programming growing up, these men are very immature psychologically. They're like little children psychologically. And they consider these military actions against you and your family a game. That is what they consider it. And they win the game when they destroy you and your family. So once these people get into your life and you're able to get away from them, you're able to wake up and get away from them. Very often, these men will change their identities. They will even go get plastic surgery on their faces. They will have augmentation done on their faces that will change the way their faces appear. They'll get nose jobs. They'll get cheek augmentation. They'll get chin augmentation, which means pieces of bone or silicone-like materials are surgically implanted all over their face that changes their facial structure and makes them appear like a different individual. So my mother broke up with Dennis Whiskey, also known as Ed Harris, around the summer of 2002. He began to act very controlling and after alienating me to the point that I did not 
want to go to my mother's house as long as she was living with Dennis Witzke. After getting me out of the picture, he started to pick on my brother, my younger brother. And Chris is a very quiet kid. He's very easy to get along with. And what Dennis began to say is that he wanted Chris to move out. Now Chris has a learning disability. Chris did okay through high school and he got better and better. And by his senior year in high school, he had made a lot of friends and he went on to go to college at SUNY University in New York. He went on to art school and during his second year of art school, they began to pick on him and they lit his car on fire and they began to steal things out of his room. And when my mother went and asked the security, the campus security, why his car had been lit on fire and she wanted a report filed. They said a report had been filed, but they could not release any details to her because it was a matter of security. It was a matter of privacy and they could not release the details to her. So they were defending whoever vandalized his car by apparently damaging his car with fire. They burned his car. The vehicle had been burned. So my brother also became a target of the MK Ultra program. And this went on and on until he dropped out of college and he moved back in with my mom. So he is a very quiet young man. He likes to keep to himself and he doesn't cause any problems. So Dennis Witzke said that if he has a problem, they should move him into a home, some sort of mental health facility. They should sign him over to the state and to some institution because Chris was too quiet and he was too old to stay at home. So at that time, my brother was 20 years old. He's basically still a teenager. And here Dennis Witzke is saying, it's time to get him out. It's time to move him out. And if he cannot make it on his own, then you should sign him over to the state. You should put him in some sort of institution. So that is the type of man that Dennis Witzke, also known as Ed Harris, is. The truth was that Dennis Witzke did not want my brother in the house because he knew that he helped my mother. He is a good son and a good friend to his mother. And I bet you anything that Dennis Witzke, also known as Ed Harris and Otis Tool, thought that if he could not get away with all of the things that he had planned for my mother, if things were not going as planned, maybe it would work better if my mother was all alone. So he got one son out of the picture and then went to work to get her other son removed from her house because these men are all about breaking up American families. So this is a perfect example about how these men love to take their sons as soon as they hit the age of 18 and then ship them off to the military to get programmed, used, and abused in the U.S. military. This is that mentality. So my mother began to see another side to Dennis, a very childish and spoiled side to him. She said he began to act like a little kid who would throw fits when he would not get his way. So she left him. So at that time, I was about ready to move out of that condo that I had bought in Brookfield. So I moved in with some friends from Danbury, and I had plans to relocate to New Hampshire because I had met Rachel. So my mother and brother moved into that condo. So I think that I made it possible for my mother to leave Dennis Witzke. So that is how real people help one another. That is how family members help one another. I signed over the condo to my mother that her and my brother moved into, which helped her escape Dennis Witzke. So my mother worked at Danbury High School. She is an English teacher. So after breaking up with Dennis in the summer of 2002, a couple of years go by, and then she meets an individual named Jim Pace. And Jim Pace is also a teacher at Danbury High School. And I think that he ran the in-school suspension room. So Jim Pace, of course, is another agent of the MK Ultra program. After my mother escaped Dennis Witzke, also known as Ed Harris, also known as Otis Tool, the military is going to make sure that other military agents will approach her as friends. 
so I speak about Jim Pace in the very important video series entitled Flower of Life and he is in part 15 through 18 so these are quick videos they're about 10 or 15 minutes each I want to refer you to that video so I do not want to repeat a lot of information that is covered about the agent known as Jim Pace however an update is that Jim Pace is the actor known as Jeffrey Demon I think that is how you pronounce that and it's spelled D-E-M-U-N-N -N, like demon I don't think it's just by chance that that is his name I think that that is a stage name it is another alias that these actors come up with and he is best known for his role in the movie called Citizen X I think that that was an HBO original and Citizen X is about a pedophile and serial killer from Russia named Andre Chikatilo and it is a very disturbing movie and throughout that whole movie Jeffrey Demon plays the serial killer and he is shown stabbing children out in the woods so I looked up Jeffrey Demon Jeffrey Demon on Wikipedia and I do not recognize any of the other movies that he is in so I think that he is a little known actor sometimes these actors have two or three different names but Jeffrey Demon does not appear to have a lot of roles that are memorable ones from memorable films so Jim Pace is recognized to be Jeffrey Demon and he approached my mother as a fellow teacher at Danbury High School so he became my mother's friend and he kind of acted like a nervous individual that really did not have a lot to say so he was a very quiet guy when I first met him we got into an argument over politics and he got extremely angry and he stormed out and I guess they later advised him to fix his attitude problem and he compensated that by just becoming more quiet I did not dislike Jim Pace but I didn't like him either whenever he was around he would have dinner with us or we would sit in the living room together when I would go visit my mother and Jim Pace would have very little to say so some interesting notes about Jeffrey DeMunn was that it says on Wikipedia that he moved to Britain in the early 70s to receive theatrical training at the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School and then he moved back to the States and he went on to develop plays at the Eugene O'Neill Theatre Center in Waterford, Connecticut and it also says that Jeffrey DeMunn was born in Buffalo, New York so what is interesting to note is that Jeffrey DeMunn went on to live and work in the same state that we lived in so my mother went on to sell that condo and she moved to California and Jim Pace also known as Jeffrey DeMunn he moved to California with her and after a year or two my mother said to him that she realized that they were not getting along Jim Pace was a difficult individual to get along with because he had no individual hobbies or pursuits or interests when he moved to California he retired from teaching and she said he would do nothing but pace around the house all day often looking at her strangely as if he did not know what to do with himself and then if she planned for them to take a trip for them to go to a museum or to a tourist area he would ruin the trips he would complain and insist that he wanted to go right back home so at home he acted real nervous and anxious as if he did not know what to do with himself but if you planned something for him to do if you planned a nice trip to take with him he would go out of his way to ruin that trip so she told him I don't mind if you want to come visit me but I think we should break up because I do not think you're happy in California and you often talk about your brother and your sister that you miss so why don't you move back to Danbury but you're more than welcome to come visit me in California 
So that is what Jim did. They sold the house they had together in California. My mother moved into a condominium in California and Jim Pace got a condominium back in Danbury, Connecticut where he lived for most of the year. So for the most part my mother remained friends with Jim Pace also known as Jeffrey DeMunn and when she and my brother would want to come visit Connecticut she would stay at Jim Pace's condominium. So at that time which was around 2007, 2008 and up I had moved back to Waterbury, Connecticut with my wife Rachel Vogt who I met in New Hampshire. I went on a trip to Portsmouth where I met Rachel Vogt and eventually she moved to Connecticut and we eventually got a condo in Waterbury, Connecticut. So when my mother would come visit Connecticut she would stay at Jim Pace's condo in Danbury and we would drive over there to go visit. So at that time my daughters were very young. Eliza was three or four years old and Michaela was one or two. So around 2008 I was introduced to Jim Pace's brother named Richie Pace and I met Richie Pace at Jim Pace's condominium in Danbury, Connecticut and they said they were from New York City and that Richie Pace was a truck driver. He was part of the truck driver union. He was something like a teamster out of New York City and when you would meet Richie Pace he gave off the impression of being an old tough guy from New York City. When they got together they acted as if they were connected. They had this attitude like they were two old Italians from New York City and Richie Pace wouldn't glare at you but he would kind of give you a cold gaze through narrowed eyes and he would just kind of stare at you without saying anything. So I considered this amusing when I met him. Like what a character he is. But that is how they acted. So later on I recognized Richie Pace to be another actor. So Richie Pace is the actor known as Scott Wilson. This is Scott Wilson and he played in roles such as Exorcist Part 3. Once again, Scott Wilson wasn't the type of actor that I would recognize. I was not familiar with Scott Wilson until I recognized him in the film Exorcist Part 3. And I said to myself, that is Richie Pace. And the strange thing is, is that the actor Scott Wilson was photographed with Kevin Walsh who went to Brookfield High School. So Kevin Walsh was a kid I knew in Brookfield High School. He was a crazy kid that was in one of my classes in Brookfield High School. So Kevin Walsh sent me a friend request and so I checked out his Facebook page and I saw him photographed with the actor Scott Wilson. So later on when I recognized Scott Wilson to be Richie Pace while watching the movie Exorcist Part 3, I remembered that, that Kevin Walsh from Brookfield High School had a photograph of himself and Scott Wilson on his Facebook page. So that is another sign that these people have something to do with Brookfield, Connecticut and my family. So over the years, Jim Pace wanted very little to do with me. We just didn't have a relationship outside of me going to visit my mother. Sometimes when my wife, my daughters and I would fly to California, Jim Pace would be there at the same time. And when my mother came to visit us in Connecticut, she would stay at Jim Pace's house, at his condo. So of course we would see him then. But other than that, Jim Pace never came to visit Rachel and I at our condo in Waterbury. He never called us on the phone. We rarely had anything to do with each other whatsoever. So many years go by and in the summer of 2015 I end up getting a house. I managed to buy a house in New Hampshire and then every summer I invite my mother and brother to come stay with me in New Hampshire. So as you will hear about in the flower of life part 15 through 18 
you will hear about what I had to go through when Jim Pace, also known as Jeffrey D. Munn, was allowed to visit when my mother and brother came to visit in the summers. Of course, Jim Pace would come visit with her. And so Jim Pace did not like to go on too many trips with us. If we had something planned for the weekend or for the day, Jim Pace would say he's just too tired to do anything. The only thing he wanted to do was stay at my house when I wasn't there and just sit in the recliner and watch TV. That was his excuse. But he did a number of things that ranged from dirty tricks to things that would endanger my life. So by letting Jim Pace into my house is the same thing as letting a military agent into your house. And he tampered with my furnace. He poured urine into my work boots. He put black mold spores all over the house. And he tampered with my cell phone charger, making it so that somebody could get electrocuted by it. So I want to refer you to the flower of life, parts 15 through 18, that will explain what life is like with Jeffrey D. Munn, also known as Jim Pace. So after his stay in the summer of 2018, I found black mold and white mold growing all over the house. And there was something like urine or some sort of medium that had been poured all over the house on pillows, on a bunch of outdoor toys for my children kept down in the basement right by a window. They were covered with a substance that smelled like urine. So after his stay in the summer of 2018, I found mold growing all over the house. He even put it on my children's dollhouse. They had a wooden dollhouse that had been a gift from my mother. So it took me almost a year to sterilize every part of my house and rid the house of black mold. So after going through one prank after the next, finding one disgusting thing after the next, after Jim Pace's visits from the summer of 2016 to the summer of 2017 to the summer of 2018, that was the final straw. And I made a video exposing him that you could hear about in the flower of life. And I also made a documentary video explaining how to kill black mold in case anybody else finds it growing all over their house, courtesy of the U.S. military or the Freemasons. So after exposing him on the internet and making the black mold documentary videos, it seems that Jim Pace, also known as Jeffrey D. Munn, he lost some heart, he lost some power. So I do not have a lot of pictures of Jim Pace, but Jim Pace always had dark eyes. He had brown eyes. He is recognized to be Jeffrey D. Munn. So this is one of the photographs that I have of Jim Pace. My mother took this photograph of him with her cell phone. I think that this is Jeffrey D. Munn. So as I was doing the Flower of Life documentary, I called my mother up and said, you know, mom, I don't have any photographs of Jim Pace. Do you have one or two that I could have? So she sent over three or four photographs of Jim Pace. So one of the photographs that she sent over was this one. And in this photograph, Jim Pace has blue eyes. This does not look like Jim Pace. It looks like a look-alike. And once again, my mother has taken this photograph of this individual in a restaurant with her cell phone. And you can see that he has blue eyes. So this is not the original Jim Pace. This is a look-alike. This is somebody else. So I would not be surprised to learn that this is Scott Wilson. This is Jim Pace's so-called brother named Richie Pace also known as Scott Wilson. So if you remember, Dennis Witzke, also known as Ed Harris, 
looks almost identical to the actor Scott Wilson, also known as Richie Pace. So now you have not only Scott Wilson who could act as Jim Pace, but also Ed Harris could also act as Jim Pace. So the original Jim Pace was Jeffrey D. Munn, and Jeffrey D. Munn, his doubles, his twins were the actors Scott Wilson and Ed Harris. So here comes Dennis Witzke, also known as Otis Tool, back into my mother's life. And in order to pull this off, these guys, Scott Wilson and Ed Harris, are getting plastic surgery. They're getting extensive plastic surgery so that they resemble Jim Pace. So like I said in the beginning of this segment, this suggests extreme psychosis. These men will do whatever it takes to manipulate and control my mother, to control or sabotage her life. And I guess it is not too much of a stretch because as these guys get older, all of these Hollywood military agents want to get plastic surgery. It says Ed Harris was born in 1950, so he is 72 years old now. And it says that Jeffrey D. Munn was born in 1947. And it says Scott Wilson was born in 1942. But they will go so far as to get the plastic surgery to all look alike so that they could pass as Jim Pace because my mother has become a big target and I have become the number one target of the US military. So this is what they do in the MK Ultra program. If you're friends with somebody, they will have one, two, three, or even several lookalikes. I do not think the US military wants any of their agents to develop a true friendship with their targets. And part of the way they do that is that they have several lookalikes all act as your friend. So you think that you have one friend, Joe Schmo, and Joe Schmo is actually five, six, or seven different military agents that all act as Joe Schmo. So once again, in the US military, they do not value individuality. These agents are something like androids. They're something like clones. What they like to do is they like to transform into somebody else. They act in that role and then they transform into somebody else. That is the practice in the US military. So this is very disturbing to say the least. And as these reports go on, I'm going to expose quite a few people that I knew personally that were part of these, for lack of a better word, clone programs, these double programs, these twin programs. So Jim Pace and Richie Pace acted as doubles. They acted as twins. So they know how to transform into each other to both act as the same individual. And this is what these secret societies that are all linked to these giant religions have done. This is what they have developed. This is how they infiltrate. This is how they take over. If they marry into a family, they could take over that family's farmland. They could take over that family's estate. They could take over that family's children. This is what has evolved in these secret societies. This has become their practice. This has become one of their violent alternatives to war. I don't want to say it's an alternative to war. It's a different method of warfare. This is often how militaries will wage war on the people who live in their own country. 
And once they take control of somebody's family, what these men do is beyond violent. What these men do is beyond evil. This is almost what they prefer to do so that they could set up a relationship with the people they plan on attacking. It's part of their MK Ultra games. It is part of the pastimes of their secret societies. Instead of just bombing your village, they would rather move in, act as your friends, act as your girlfriends, move into your house, and then go through these strange ritualistic practices involving their secret societies and their agents as they interface with you, as they play these games with your life. And once they get sick of toying with you, they then want to destroy your life and kill you. And they look at themselves as gods. These little android clones that all act as the same person. And they fool regular Americans. So if you start going out with one of these women and they give you one good year, they don't poison you or attack you or try to kill you for a year. According to them, you really owe them. They have so much power over you that they are like gods. All the rest of them wanted to kill you. They wanted to run you over with their car. They wanted to set up a sniper outside of your house and put a bullet in your head. But instead they gave you one good year. So you should be forever indebted to them. You had trouble finding work. And then one of the gods took pity on you. And made it possible for you to get hired at $30,000 a year. And you were allowed to work beside their gods for two or three years without getting tortured or attacked. So aren't they good gods? These multi-millionaires from England and Germany and Italy and Israel. Aren't they good gods for showing you such compassion? They talk the others into allowing you to live for another year or two while they played with you, while they toyed with you. And then when the gods grow sick of you, then they'll start to poison you. They'll start to drug you. They'll put black mold in your house. If you heat your houses with oil and you have a large oil tank in your basement, like most people, they will arrange for your oil delivery company to have poisons dumped into your oil tank all winter long that release vapors that will attack your respiratory system. Then they'll zap you with their directed energy weapons and your body will be so sick already from the drugs, from the poison, from the junk in the oil tank to the black mold growing all over your house that these directed energy weapons will nearly kill you and the only thing that you will be able to do is stumble out of your house where these agents will be waiting for you maybe one or two friendly faces that will say I know what to do I know what you're going through and I know what to do and if you trust them and you go with them you will find yourself abducted and tied up somewhere so that masses of these secret society members could show up like an audience and watch somebody slowly torture you to death. And that is the grand finale for these so-called gods of the secret societies and these large international religions. This is their religious right. This is their right to commit human sacrifice. This is their offering to their gods. This practice has gone back thousands of years. This practice has gone back to the dawn of man on this planet. And this is just the best part for these agents. This is where it all leads up to. This is where it all culminates. This is the meaning to all of their games. And this is even better than dropping a bomb on a village. This is even better than dressing up in camouflage and then marching into a village with M16s in some foreign country. This is even more interesting for them. And then, what they do to their victims just gets worse and worse to the point that it's just a nightmare. It becomes hell on earth what they're doing to people, innocent people. And what's funny is that when you catch a Jeffrey Dahmer or a Ted Bundy or one of their serial killers, everybody is taught 
that you got to take this serial killer and treat them gently. Put them in a nice little prison cell with a mattress and a blanket. Bring them three hot meals a day. Make it possible so they can watch TV. Give them a little job at the prison, in the kitchen, where they could earn a little extra money. And then buy things off the commissary list to make their time more endurable. As we treat these serial killers and these monsters humanely. That's what we're all taught. Meanwhile, when these members of these secret societies arrest somebody, they secretly arrest one of their targets. They're going to tie them up somewhere. They're going to burn them and they're going to torture them slowly as a form of amusement to their other members. They are going to rape them. They are going to disfigure them. So that is how they treat their prisoners. And then when you catch some of these people, when you catch the oddest tools and the Henry Lee Lucases and the Robin Gex and the Tom Cocorellises and the Ted Bundys and the Jeffrey Dahmers, you better treat them with nothing but kindness, courtesy and respect because these are their gods. These are their priests. These are their brothers. These are their sisters in these religious secret society orders. And they'll go into the prison as Robin Gecht or Otis Tool or Jeffrey Dahmer or Henry Lee Lucas and they'll be brought out the back door as your senators, as your police chief, as your Hollywood stars, as your president. They'll just go through their little morphing program. They'll go through their little plastic surgery program and they'll get released back into society to play whatever other role the military has for them. So you'll never get rid of these guys. If my mother managed to escape Ed Harris, also known as Otis Tool, he might go on another assignment, but he'll be back. He'll be back because he is the ultra powerful guy. He is the only guy that will know what to do to get into my mother's mind and get into my mother's life once again and be able to take her out. So far she has gotten by with nothing but luck, with nothing but the skin of her teeth. They haven't got her yet. She's still free. Well, we'll just see about that. That's something that Ed Harris would say. And then that expert of the MK Ultra program, the best of their best, will try to re-enter her life as somebody else and this time be successful in taking her out no matter who has her back no matter how intelligent she is that is how they think so as I exposed Jim Pace the original Jim Pace who was Jeffrey D. Munn he had two clones to take his place one of which is Dennis Witzke also known as Ed Harris who looks exactly like Scott Wilson who was introduced to me as Jim Pace's brother. So this came in the mail, this magazine. It's a health and nutrition magazine. I have no idea why they would send this magazine to me. I did not order it. It came like junk mail. And on the cover is a guy named Gundry, Dr. Gundry. And if you look at him, this appears to be Ed Harris having undergone extensive plastic surgery. Just look at this photograph of Jim Pace, whatever you want to call this guy. So this looks exactly like this guy, Dr. Gundry. So this is either Ed Harris posing as Dr. Gundry or it is Scott Wilson posing as Dr. Gundry. So if you look up Dr. Gundry right now on the internet, chances are he is going to be one of 20 men who all play the role of Dr. Gundry. There are a bunch of actors that are paid to do roles. If they have a similar look, they could play Dr. Gundry today. And so they think it's a, a big joke 
or they get a big kick out of sending me the Dr. Gundry Your Health magazine. And they probably did not think I would recognize him. But here he is on the cover. And this is either Ed Harris having undergone lots of plastic surgery. Or it is Scott Wilson. And as you can see, he resembles Jim Pace. So it's a big game to these idiots involved in these secret societies and the MK Ultra program. So I want everybody to take a look at this photograph of Dr. Gundry. I want you to take a good look at his eyes. These are the eyes of hate. This guy represents complete and utter hate. And we're taught to regard these people as our role models, as Hollywood stars, as our leaders. There is something inside of them that demands that. That's what keeps them going. They have multi-personality disorder. And the most evil men on the planet, they need to be looked at as your heroes. That is what gives them the power that they need to do these things to the American public and to the public of whatever country they are in. As they do the most terrible crimes in secret, they need to be looked at as your heroes. They need that. They need to dress up in the Hollywood movies and be regarded as your heroes, as your good guys, as your Boy Scouts. They need that recognition because part of them is like a little child. A lot of good people do good deeds and they do not need a reward for them. They do not need recognition. They do not receive recognition. They do not receive any awards. They do not receive any medals. But they get up day after day and do the right thing because that is the only thing to do. So that is one of the things that I detest about these individuals. They are the worst people on the planet but they need to be recognized as your heroes. They need that. They need to be looked at as the good guys. You give them the power that drives them. So nothing illustrates this more than Dr. Gundry on the cover of Your Health magazine. So the funny thing is, is that I have been hearing about Dr. Gundry for about two or three years now from my mother. And my mother found him on the internet and she tells me how he has the best advice about diet, about how to stay healthy by eating the right foods. And the funny thing is, is that half of what she tells me is the information that I came up with. I do not do many reports on health or nutrition, but I do speak to my daughters and my mother and family members about those sort of things. And my mom will say, wow, you sound exactly like Dr. Gundry. Dr. Gundry was saying the exact same thing. I saw a show on YouTube and Dr. Gundry was saying the exact same thing as you are now. And the reason I sound like Dr. Gundry is due to the fact that this is one of the agents that spy on me. These are one of the agents that will get a copy of my grocery receipt every time I go shopping to analyze what foods I eat. He'll listen to my phone calls when I speak to my daughters about vitamins and their diet, what they should be eating and what they should not be eating. So I never looked up Dr. Gundry when my mother would say those things to me. So when this magazine arrived and I took a look at this Dr. Gundry and I recognized him to be a Jim Pace model, most likely Ed Harris, I began to realize why Dr. Gundry's information and videos were made readily available to my mother because once again he needs to be looked at as a good guy. This is how these agents of the MK Ultra program think. It's a blend of superstition, the occult, and psychology with these people. And he's going to get some power over her by influencing her to look for him on YouTube and to watch his videos on YouTube where he poses as a doctor who discusses good nutrition and diet. So that gives them the power and the will 
to try to run more games on her psychologically. That is what drives them. This is what they do. They like interacting with regular people. That is what these quote-unquote stars and the members of these secret societies are into. They like to mingle with regular people, befriend them, get to know them. So these games get evil. When your daughter begins to date one of these men, one of these young men, and the military wants to make it, so she's dating four or five of them. You can see how they have no respect for the human way. They have no respect for anything. Not your daughters, not your sons, not for marriage, not for families, not for human decency, not for your country. They don't have respect for anything except their hive organization, their hive filled with all of their drones that look and think and act alike. And if you invite one of them into your houses, you're inviting all of them into your houses. So you can see how dangerous these people are. You can see how dangerous the military is through these secret societies that play these ritualistic games concerning mind control. So this is what they're up to. This is why there is all this secrecy in the government concerning what the military is up to. This is how they destroy humanity. It is sad when you think about it. If you could think about your sons and daughters being treated in this way, being fooled by these networks of homosexual agents, these networks of bisexual agents. And what that means is that they have been abused starting at a young age by men and women. And they are taught to have sex with everybody. They are taught to live in a group sex community where there is no married couples. There is no family unit. Everybody has sex with everybody else. Everybody is the same. So that is what they want to pull you and your families into. So that is how they are brought up in a group that practices group sex. We as straight people, regular people, we as regular people would call that pedophilia. We would call that morally wrong. We would understand that that breaks down society. It attacks the family. It attacks the family unit. And the people develop a disturbed psyche. So this is what they're trying to pull you and your families into. They're a disturbed community. And they know a lot of people don't go for it. They don't like it. And oftentimes these people who do not like it have higher intelligence than their group. They have a higher sense of morality and ethics because they think about things more. They analyze their own behavior more. So this group promotes those that cannot do that. They cannot see themselves. They have a low intelligence and a low sense of morality. So those are the people that they want to succeed within their community. And the ones that do not like their lifestyle and their plans for human life, they stand out and they become targets of these people involved in these secret societies and military programs that practice this mind control, pedophilia, ritual abuse, and human sacrifice. 